it's okay to fail. Sometimes we need to fail to learn to win, that we learn from our failures if we treat them emotionally in the right way. I've actually seen companies who have failure points and every employee would be given 10 failure points per month. And at the end of the quarter, if they haven't used them, they're in trouble. Because failure does mean being brave enough to explore things and explore opportunities. I think failure is a great thing. Uh, there's two parts of the development process. One is analytical, where you solve problems on paper, you do simulations, you use technical skills, but you can't avoid the empirical part, which is trial and error. You've got to try things and arguably you will fail. But failure is a great thing, great for culture. Small Biz Digital Media presents Connect, Convince, Convert, inspiring business success stories with Dave Bird, Steve Ennis and Martin Hill. Welcome to Christo Shivachev of Simple Design Work. Thank you for having me on the podcast. It's great to be here. Could you just tell us a little bit about what you do and how you create a culture of innovation within your clients? We are a product design house and we specialize in user-centric design and innovation management and we focus on physical product. But one thing that we find really exciting as specialists in the process rather than specialists in a certain field is, is the opportunity to innovate and help our clients build internal capability when it comes to managing innovation. If you look at the way the term innovation evolved over the last 20 years, it's been quite a transition because back in the day, you were talking about r and departments, working in silos, working on technical projects. Whereas these days, innovation could be anything. It could be a new business model, it could be a new process, it could be a new material, a new manufacturing method. It's a much more holistic approach um, to solving a problem. It's something the whole business needs to be involved in, not just a separate team. And you really need to work together in order to deliver innovation successfully. When we work on a project delivery with a client, we will try and actually help them increase their internal capabilities, whether this is understanding how to manage the process or understanding the different types of innovation so they can align their expectations accordingly. Yeah. And an innovation could be something as simple as a, a, a tweet for process to create more efficiency or create a better customer experience that can be done instantly by a member of the team all the way through to a major innovation. I think you have four categories of innovation. There are many different classification, uh, you know, systems I've seen. They could be four, five, seven, nine, eleven. But we normally focus on four because we feel that that pretty much represents pretty much everything most of the companies would do out there. You're absolutely right. Innovation could be quite, quite small. It could be quite invisible and insignificant in a way. But it's very important that we focus on those types of innovation because typically they would form about 70% of the R&D activities within a business. So we normally use the four model, the model of four different types of innovation, and that would be incremental innovation, that would be sustaining, that would be disruptive, and that would be breakthrough. So if you think of the incremental innovation, these are normally small projects that could be completed in a few months. They're not technologically too advanced. They don't have a significant impact on the market. Um, think of it this way, you know, it could be different colors, different sizes, it could, be, it could be your software update on your phone. It's something that happens in the background that allows you to, to stay current with your um, client's need and, and just make sure your proposition is, is in line with your customer's needs. The next step up would be the sustaining innovation, and this is a little bit more significant because it takes about 12 to 24 months to deliver a project like this. Again, in the world of phones, that's your new handset. But it's just something that allows you to sustain your market position. And even though these type of projects are not technologically too advanced or too challenging, they do create a lot of excitement. Yeah. You've seen people lining up outside Apple stores to get the new handset. So they are an opportunity to, to create another touch point with your customers and offer something new and cool and exciting. And obviously, in that period of time, consumer behavior changes. So it's a great opportunity to make sure that you make that statement, you know, you've, we've listened and this is the new product and yeah. we've addressed all these points. The next type, I would say, is the disruptive innovation. And this is a lot more significant as far as technological advances are concerned. This is a five years plus project where you work very hard on something a little bit more technical, a little bit more disruptive and behavior changing. So that's why these projects actually take a while because it's not only finding the right answer, but it's actually having a strategy of transitioning your customers of this type of behavior towards a different type of behavior. And the final type is the breakthrough innovation, which again is 
quite technically complex, but it actually has less impact on the market because this is where we come to the difference between disruptive and breakthrough. Disruptive innovation is normally very cheap and accessible to everyone, whereas breakthrough is just still very expensive. Technically, it works, but it's only for, the, you know, for somebody with a reasonable budget. Spotify is a good example for disruptive innovation. Netflix, if you think of back in the day, renting a film from Blockbuster or buying a CD for the same cost. Now you can actually listen to as much music as you like, or you can watch as many films as you like. So it's taking that product and making it more affordable. Um, same as Henry Ford and what he did with yeah. the mass-produced car. Yeah. Before Henry Ford, not everybody could have a car, yeah. but he made it accessible. Whereas breakthrough innovation is more, if you think of space tourism, something that costs quite a lot, it might be cheap one day, but at the moment the technology is there or thereabout, but it's not commercially affordable. Many, many years ago, uh, CEO of GE, if those people that remember GE Capital, made a statement of uh, innovate or die. And I think your example with Netflix and streaming services is absolutely apt there that people like Blockbuster didn't innovate. They continued renting videos out, VHS, DVD. They weren't able to pivot. They didn't pivot. And they're no longer with us. Absolutely. I mean, innovation is always user-centric. So you really, in order for you to actually have confidence in a project, you really need to understand your targeted customer's behavior. Yeah. You need to understand the pain points. You need to understand the opportunities to create delight. But the most important thing is you have to be able to imagine that future behavior. What does that look like? What does the product look like? Yeah. And then you can actually put a program together to deliver that proposition. What advice would you give to owners of small, medium businesses in terms of innovation? It all starts with the customer. So I'd say in order for you to validate whether a project is worth doing or not, it really comes down to understanding your consumer behavior because consumer behavior changes faster than ever before. Even through COVID, we saw brand loyal customers moving to the next best alternative that they could source locally. So perceptions are changing, behavior is changing, expectations are changing. I would say that the best advice I can give is, first of all, talk to your customers. Make sure that you are a user-centric business. And some companies think they are, but if you check when was the last time they actually spoke to their clients, it's quite some time ago. So make sure that that communication is always open and it's two-way and you use as many channels as you can. And the second one is actually have an understanding of, of the different types, even if it's very basic, different types of innovation, because that will allow you to manage your own expectations. So if you're starting an incremental innovation project, that's something that's not going to burn a lot of cash. This is something you can complete and deliver within a few months. If you're starting a, a disruptive project and you're thinking, I'm expecting a return within six months, this is not going to happen. And actually, this is one of the barriers for innovation. So it's really important to understand the structure. And, and typically, we offer the 10, 20, 70% ratio, which works for a lot of things out there. If you try and keep 10% of your innovation projects as disruptive, 20% as sustaining, and 70 as incremental. It's the incremental innovation that pays for everything else. So make sure you have structure, make sure you understand how much of what you're doing, and make sure you actually, that the projects you're picking on are meaningful and impactful. You're not designing for the sake of designing. So a fundamental message there is get customer feedback. Always. What are you doing? What are you doing well? What are you not doing that might add value to your clients, which might give an idea about a new product or service? To have an objective in mind and then create the structure around it. And make sure you have different mechanisms of getting those feedback. Uh, this feedback, um, it could be qualitative sessions, it could be quantitative sessions. Make sure you do observational studies as well. Very often customers have problems they don't realize or they don't think about. So it's having those different channels and, and going into a little bit more depth. If you spoke to 300 customers and you identify the trend, spend a little bit more time with 10 or 12. Spend half a day with each and find the why. Why is this a problem? Why are you doing it this way? And then observe. But it's all customer-centric. It has to originate from the customer. With innovation, doing something differently, it's a change project. It's changing the way we do things. It might be introducing a new product and developing that product or service. Maybe for smaller businesses, there's an element of risk attached to that. I think there's two risks. One is people perceive there's a risk of it not working, a risk of failure, which they might like to avoid. Or it's going back to Blockbuster. There's a risk of not innovating. What message would you give to, to business owners around embracing that risk in the right way? Innovation is all to do with managing risk 
budgets and time scales. So what I would suggest is take a more structured approach and I would suggest split the process in two different parts. The first part would be a proof of concept and I always recommend the fail fast approach. Get hands on as quickly as you can. Produce something, even if it's a little bit more Heath Robinson, even if it's not very well defined or, you know, we very often produce prototypes that you, you can swap a few components and try different handles or try different materials or keep the flexibility. But the idea is go broad. Consider all the opportunities out there. And even if a concept doesn't look like the best option, still explore it because if you end up patenting your product, you can surround the main claim with, with alternative claims and, and vague comments that help you get a greater monopoly on the market. But don't dismiss anything too quickly. Don't go into solution mode too quickly. But get hands-on. Produce something. Test it with your customers. It is that customer testing that actually gives you an answer whether you've got proof of concept. Yeah. Once you've actually explored all the options, once you've found what works in principles, then focus on stage two. That's the execution. So you can get the engineers to optimize it, get it to perform as well as it could, do the design for manufacture, and consider the whole life cycle of the product. This is the refining stage where you put that detail in. I would say that if you know what project you're tackling from the four different types, if you approach the, the project in a structural way, it's actually more fun than... <laughs> than stressing and obviously there's cost associated with it, but you find great insights. You can actually increase your innovation equity with your customers. Amazing new ideas can come out. It's definitely something worth doing. Yeah. So it's, it's doing that proper planning. Yeah. And it's, it's not that complicated. It's actually common sense. Um, I would suggest having a look at the British Design Council diagram for the double diamond. That process is amazing and it just pretty much sums it up and it can sound technical, but if you actually think of the meaning of every every single part. It's actually quite logical. One of the important points that we should highlight, and, and this is maybe where some businesses tend to shy away from, is getting that client feedback. It can be uncomfortable. It's okay to fail. Sometimes we need to fail to learn to win, that we learn from our failures if we treat them emotionally in the right way. I've actually seen companies who have failure points and every employee would be given 10 failure points per month. And at the end of the quarter, if they haven't used them, they're in trouble. Because failure does mean being brave enough to explore things and explore opportunities. I think failure is a great thing. Uh, there's two parts of the development process. One is analytical, where you solve problems on paper, you do simulations, you use technical skills, but you can't avoid the empirical part, which is trial and error. You've got to try things and arguably you will fail. But failure is a great thing, great for culture. If you want to review the opportunities to innovate within your space, I would suggest look a little bit further or maybe give me a call. I'd be very happy to jump on a call and talk in a lot more detail about the barriers of innovation, how we create a culture of innovation and how you explore opportunities in a more structured way. It really isn't that complicated. This episode of Connect, Convince, Convert was produced by Dave Bird and presented by Martin Hill. Be sure to subscribe if you enjoyed it so you don't miss any future shows.